Listeners, readers, welcome to this Foxed Page How to Read. This is segment number two. In the first How to Read, we tackled narrative stance. Today, we are going to be discussing plot. This is arguably more important even than narrative stance. Uh, we just dove in with that during the first How to Read just because it sounded fun to me. But the idea of plot is really on some level more kind of fundamental even than narrative stance. Although, of course, the two, um, you know, depend on each other in quite a few different ways. So we'll first start off, just kick ourselves off here with a definition of plot. I think everyone has a sense of it, uh, but really what we're talking about here are the major events that are happening in any story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, that are moving the narrative forward. So that's important. It's not just any event in the story. It's the things that are really kind of propelling us forward in some sort of structure. So the first kind of mention of plot um, is dated back to like 330-ish BCE, before the Common Era, um, in Aristotle's Poetics. So basically, if you want to sort of boil down what Aristotle had to say, it was simply that any plot needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. So we have that idea, which is, is very basic. And we have, um, in, in the seminars in the past, we've talked a little bit about the notion of classical unities. So then in Greek sort of drama, um, you know, sort of people like Aristophanes and Euripides, those people um, had something called these classical unities, and they had a lot to do with plot. They said that essentially um, any sort of three act play needed to happen within kind of a tight time frame. It needed to have a stable and limited cast of characters and it needed to happen all in one place. So we have these kind of classical ideas of what makes fiction work and plot and these classical unities are sort of examples of that kind of structure. And then in the beginning of the 19th century, this German guy, leave it to a, a, a you know a good German uh, who I think of, I mean, talk about trading and stereotypes, but I think of German people as being very orderly and very sort of methodical and being very thorough. So this German novelist, uh, his last name is Freitag. I wanna say Gustav, uh, but I think maybe that's because I've got Gustav Flaubert on the mind. Uh, but this, this guy named Freitag came up with this idea of Freitag's pyramid. I always call it Freytag's triangle, and I think kind of both work. Um, it is definitely kind of a pyramid shape. What Freytag was getting at was this very sort of consistent sort of diagram that you could apply to most stories, most sort of large plots in any fictive work. Again, he was a novelist. He also was a nonfiction writer, but mostly fiction. So you, I think many of you learned this back in like 10th grade, uh, you know, English, but just to refresh your memories about the Freytag Triangle, those of you who are um, watching on YouTube can now see a diagram of it. Also, for those of you who are hearing any kind of background noise right now, I'm in my mudroom. And the reason I'm in my mudroom is because I have these needlepoint um, creations that I myself made of Virginia Woolf. My sister-in-law Maggie gave me uh, the original, which is right here. Um, the original uh, sort of needlepoint kit and needlepoint was really the way that I got myself through COVID all of the all of the fiber arts actually but needlepoint really became my jam for the first time ever and so I did this first one which I did it the way that the kit instructed and then I just couldn't get enough and I was really immersed in this idea of like really communing with Virginia Woolf who is my literary idol my my literary hero my favorite author so then I did this kind of pop art situation over here and then I um, I did this kind of grayscale situation over here, although my daughter reminded me, or not reminded, but pointed out that this is not in fact grayscale. There's a lot of like creaminess happening over here. But for those of you who are hearing um, the washer dryer, different things happening, um, you know, I could have waited, but I didn't want to wait. I wanted to record this guy and I wanted it to be here surrounded by Virginia Woolf. Okay, who is going to come up, in fact, in our discussion today? Her incredible novel, Orlando, is really a masterclass in how to break all the rules of plot. Okay, so back to Freitag. Um, Freitag was this German novelist, and he came up with this diagram where you sort of, in the beginning, you have exposition, so the line is kind of flat. Exposition is simply background information. Then you have something called an inciting incident. And at that point, um, you know, we have an inflection point there, just to do some, you know, Silicon Valley tech speak. We have an inflection point, which is broader than just that, but there's a lot of, you know, inflection points around here in these startups and whatnot. 
um, then the, the, the sort of triangle um, or the pyramid begins to climb. We have an inciting incident. Then we move up um, and we have what's called rising action. So usually the inciting incident is some sort of conflict or at least the beginnings of a conflict. Rising action is where the tension is building and the, you know, the plot is thickening, as it were. We go up and up and up all the way to the top of the triangle or the pyramid, and that is where we have our climax. Then we have falling action, which is sort of a sharper downward thing. Usually the climax is going to come sort of three quarters of the way through a, you know, a plot driven book. And then we have our falling action where things are kind of, um, you know, uh, you have sort of the aftermath of whatever the crisis is. And then we have something that's the falling action. Then the line kind of flattens back out again. And we have what is called denouement, or um, there's another word for it. I, I like the French one, although who knows why we have that one random French word, but the denouement comes from the Latin, um, like for not, like a, in Spanish, it would be like a nudo, that idea of kind of unknotting. So oftentimes the denouement is like a, um, it, it's a kind of an unraveling and it's almost like, you know, you're figuring out kind of what's going to happen next. So the immediate crisis is over and then you're getting kind of a sense of what is going to happen to all of the main players uh, and, and sort of how the incidents, uh, at least from the very beginning of the book that have, have um, you know, the, the climax has occurred, the action has fallen, and now everything is kind of either going back to the way it was before or is radically changed as is often the case. So the next kind of big one I wanna to touch on is E.M. Forrester, Aspects of the Novel, was a book that he published in 1927. E.M. Forrester being uh, the author, he's part of that Bloomsbury group uh, with Virginia Woolf. 1927 is the year that uh, To the Lighthouse came out, I believe. I really ought to know that. I'm fairly certain that is correct. I think Mrs. Dalloway was 25 and To the Lighthouse was 27. So in 1927, Ian e. Forrester, who is the author of Passage to India and A Room with a View, he wrote a book called Aspects of the Novel. And he had a slightly different take on it, which I think is interesting, which kind of, it, it pushes a little more uh, toward the idea of cause and effect. So it isn't just, he, he makes a difference between story and plot. So a story is like the, the example that he uses, the king dies and then the queen dies. So you have, that's just kind of a story, but the plot is that if a king dies and then the queen dies of grief because the, queen, the king has died, oh my gosh, I knew I was gonna get a little tangled up there, um, then there's a cause and effect. So plot for E.M. Forrester really sort of has this idea of cause and effect. And I don't know that we need to like really split hairs about this, but I do think these ideas of kind of beginning, middle and end, the idea of some sort of cohesion that we get from those classical unities, and then this idea of cause and effect, all of these different sort of nuances and definitions are important as we are moving forward and talking about plot. So we have these kinds of notions um, from Aristotle all the way through E.M. Forrester and, and beyond, of course, with a heavy, um, you know, kind of scaffolding in place from Freytag. We have this idea that, that plot is kind of this um, predictable thing. And I think it is very much human nature. If you think even about how you tell a story, you know, there, there's, it usually does follow this kind of nice general pattern. So a lot of fiction does exactly that. I want to take a look at a couple of different things uh, just to really drive home this idea of how this Freytag triangle and how this idea of plot uh, plays out in an actual novel. So we are going to dive in with Gustave Flaubert. Again, I don't know if it's Gustave Freytag. I'll get back to you on that. Um, but we have with Gustave Flaubert's masterwork, Madame Bovary, published in 1856. You can very easily map onto a, a Freytag triangle the plot of Madame Bovary. So the exposition in the beginning, we have Charles as a very young child. A lot of people forget that in that exposition period, Charles actually marries a first, well, the first Madame Bovary is in fact Charles's mother, who's kind of a big presence actually in the novel. People forget that there are three Madame Bovary in fact. Then he marries another woman, an older woman, totally loveless marriage. And then the inciting incident of the novel, kind of arguably, but I think this is a good way to think about it, is that he marries young Emma. So he marries Emma and then we have this rising action where she is beginning to have some affairs. She's also beginning to, to put them into debt. 
in the climax of the novel, hate for this to be a spoiler, but I really don't think that knowing this really like takes away from the novel in any large way. Of course, I am someone who tends to not read for plot. Maybe that's why I didn't begin this series of how to read lectures with plot. It's usually just not that interesting to me, but I'm gonna spoil Madame Bovary here for you, which is that she, like Anna Karenina, well, I'm just gonna spoil all of the big classics for you. That is the climax. We have some falling action, and then we have the denouement. So in the falling action, one of the things that happens is I'm just gonna spoil the whole thing for you. Um, and then in the denouement, we kind of find out what happens to their daughter. So you can very kind of neatly fit Madame Bovary into this Freytag triangle. What is more interesting, however, is to think about the Freytag triangle a little bit differently. And I think this is very important for any of you writers out there. So you don't, I mean, you can imagine kind of the, the um, it'd be very hard to get 250 pages out of just sort of exposition, inciting incident, rising action, climax, falling action, denouement. Um, instead, what you really need to think about is that the, the rising action is made up of a bunch of little kind of smaller rising actions. So these are sometimes thought of as subplots, although subplot really does sort of, um, in my mind, a subplot is something that is moving along the whole entire story. So you can imagine kind of layering one Freytag triangle on top of another in, in some sort of a cool graphic. I'll make one for you. Look at it. There it is. There it is. I haven't made it yet, but with the magic of, um, I don't know what I'm going to make it out of yet, but there it is. If you're looking at the YouTube channel, um, you can see, in fact, the, the diagram that I'm talking about, where you would have a number of subplots that are all kind of rising and falling. But what, what I'm focusing on here is this notion that as we are having this one kind of major plot, which in Madame Bovary is you know, sort of the the affairs that she's having, the way that they drive them into debt, her suicide, uh, and the following action. What's important, though, is to recognize that on the way up, I'm making these kind of like like uh, like a jagged graph upward with my finger because you want to have smaller arcs, smaller kind of arcs of action that are happening on the way toward the climax. So the way to think about this with Madame Bovary, for example, is that we have the inciting incident of Emma coming into Charles's life, but we have another inciting incident um, as we are moving up where Emma goes to a ball and she sort of discovers, she's a country girl, but um, she has a taste for the finer things. So she goes to this ball and it is a real inciting incident because she decides in fact that she is really built uh, for something much finer and, and sort of much fancier than what Charles, the country doctor is uh, providing for her. I read a re an interesting thing recently about, we, we need to not think about Charles in fact as a country doctor. He's like, not even that, he's kind of like a, it's not, I don't, I don't actually know what a physician's assistant is, but he like had some kind of certificate and was kind of the best that you could do out in the country. But it's kind of a misnomer to think of him even as a country doctor. So that is a brief aside, a brief aside there. But um, when she goes to the ball and then she, the ball itself is kind of this rising, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, is she going to leave Charles forever? Is she going to fall in love? And then we have a climax of that small kind of story arc. And then we go back um, and we're not going back all the way to the exposition point, not to the bottom of the line, because in fact, this is ratcheting up the tension. So if you imagine that kind of, you know, jagging upward and then jagging down a bit, and then it's going to jag back up again with the next sort of chunk of this kind of, um, you can imagine kind of like stair steps a little bit, but, but spiky stair steps. So one of the things that is happening um, while Emma is discovering that she's made for finer things is that Charles is also, um, he is having uh, different sort of medical things are happening. So he, largely because Emma is dissatisfied with him, well, that's one of the reasons, but he's always um, sort of trying to better himself. And so there are a number of different kind of uh, little jiggity jag things where Charles is trying to do other things. One of them is actually a very big kind of story arc where he takes advantage of one of the country people and he really, wow, talk about a malpractice suit. I mean, if those existed back in the day, Charles would have been in even deeper debt. Um, but he really mangles, like literally mangles this poor person in the name of science and progress. I think the person has like a, a, a deformity of his foot and Charles decides he can fix it. 
and the poorer person ends up really far, far worse off. So that's an example of this kind of, um, it's it's not a subplot because it's kind of this, um, you know, a discrete event that happens and kind of has its own climax and its own falling action. But all of this is being ratcheted up because we're understanding, in fact, that Charles is not this amazing surgeon and that Emma um, is, is even less and less satisfied with her husband. So. We have another example of this kind of thing with Madame Bovary where Emma has a baby. So she has a baby and for a, like a hot second, is sort of like has this vision of herself as this doting mother. And then in fact realizes that being a mom is not that fun and not that hard. That's, I mean, sorry, it is hard. Uh, but but let, me, let me just clarify that being a mom is fun in lots of ways. I was being Emma when I just said that. Um, so she in fact basically trusts Bertha, Bert, this Bertha child um, to a, a wet nurse, to a nanny, to the nurse. And so now her child is being essentially raised by the nurse. So this is another example of one of these kind of smaller story, uh, you know, smaller kind of rising action, climax, falling action, denouement. So each of these, as we are moving upward, um, another example is, so uh, Emma develops quite a shopping habit and she has several different affairs with different men. So each one of those, is a, you know its own discrete sort of uh, incident, and then um, but each time we are moving forward, we are ratcheting up further toward um, you know the climax of the novel, which is when she just you know the rest is history. So what the, the point of all of this is that you can very kind of neatly map Madame Bovary onto this Freytag triangle in a very simplistic kind of very clear way. But I think it's more interesting to take a look at some of these kind of smaller uh, individual little story peaks, these kind of small, we'll call them mini climaxes, these little mini climaxes that are moving toward um, the, the major climax of the novel. So I love this idea of, of sort of a schema in which to look at schema? I feel like that's plural. What's the singular of schema? I don't know. Um, so, but, but it's, I like this idea because one of the things that I'm trying to help you uh, with here at the Fox page is to understand why it is that you are liking something. Um, it, you know, it's such a great feeling to read something and really be engaged with it. Um, or to understand why you're not engaged with something. And sometimes it's narrative stance, sometimes it's too much figurative language, sometimes it's a clumsy plot, sometimes it's too much plot or too little plot. But I think understanding the way that plot can function will really allow you to either appreciate or to understand why you're not maybe appreciating uh, the text at hand. So what I think is even more interesting on some level though, so yes, um, it's very satisfying to have a predictable plot. It's very sort of comforting for the reader. It's, it's predictable. It is kind of gratifying. It's easier to follow when things are kind of chronological and straightforward. I myself, of course, um, not surprisingly, am a fan of when there are real modifications or even sort of radical changes in uh, a plot. So one of the examples of this is simply the idea of starting at the end. You're kicking off the, the novel with the idea of what is going to happen at the end. So I am always more interested in how something happened or why something happened than like the what happened piece. So I'm never particularly like wound up in like, like what's going to happen to this person or like are they going to solve the mystery? I think this is one of the reasons why I'm not a great mystery reader. Um, if you're beginning, if you're sort of diffusing the question of like what happens because we have an answer at the beginning of the book, uh, then we're much more focused on why. So sometimes this is like a, a sort of just like a convention where you will have a narrator who we meet in the beginning of the book and they're going to tell us the story retrospectively. So this isn't exactly like we don't always know what's going to happen in the end. Um, at the very beginning of the book, but lots of times there are indications. So, um, for example, and, and there are a bunch of classics that are that are shaped like this. One is Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. So in the beginning, we have him in jail and he is writing the book that we are holding in our hands. Humbert Humbert is in the jail. And it's essentially um, an apology and, and kind of a um, an apotheosis of Lolita. He's sort of trying to capture his love for her, which sounds perverse, and it is. 
It's also incredible. Um, such an incredible piece of literature. If you're hesitant or you're like, ew, you should go check out the uh, lecture that I gave on Claire Dieter's Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma, which talks quite a bit about um, Nabokov, also about Woody Allen, some other very um, reprehensible men who have made art that is, um, you know, pretty masterful in some ways. So back to Lolita. Um, he is, we know at the, at the very beginning of the book, we understand that something untoward um, has, has happened. And we know that this man is in jail. So we know that he survives. And we know that, you know, um, that he is in jail for something. So we know that he got caught. We know he committed a crime, or at least has allegedly committed a crime. So we have a lot of information right up front about what has happened. And it's, it's actually very plot heavy, that novel. There's a lot happening. Um, there, there is a death, you know, sort of in the ish beginning. And then there is a, a murder that happens later. Throughout the entire book, Humbert Humbert is being um, sort of followed by someone. We don't know who that someone is. Um, and, and the revelation of who that person is, is kind of spectacular. So, and of course we are curious what is going to happen with Lolita herself and with her relationship with Humbert Humbert. So there's a lot of plot happening in Lolita. And in fact, we have a lot of information about how that plot is going to sort of um, unwind just from the very, very start of the book. I love that because again, it's focusing not on like, oh my God, is Humbert Humbert ever gonna get caught? But it's more like, how is he gonna get caught? Like how, what is it that he's going to do in order to get caught? It's also frankly, like a little bit reassuring that he does get caught because it's so gross, you know, all of the different crimes that he is committing. Um, we also have people who are writing from mental health facilities in two enormous classics. One is actually three. One is um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. You have Nick Carraway writing is he in an institution? No, I don't think he's in an institution. Now I'm really doubting myself. But we have Nick Carraway writing um, after all of this has unraveled. And, and we know, again, we know lots and lots about what is going to happen throughout the course of that incredible novel. Um, we know that right up front because of the information that Nick Carraway has given us. We understand that he has quite a bit of sympathy for Gatsby. We understand that things are not going to end well with Gatsby. So this convention of beginning um, a novel with the ending of it is very powerful. We have it again in uh, Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Holden Caulfield is definitely writing from some sort of a, um, a mental hospital. So again, we, we have um, quite a bit of information right at the front of that novel. And and that's a that's one that follows some of those nice classical unities. Everything happens in New York. It happens within the course of the summer. The unities are not as tight as what the, the Greek dramatists were wanting, um, but that is such, I mean, J.D. Salinger, it, it, that, there is a lot to offer. We're going to have to do some, some deep dives into his work because I find them so compelling. But that is one of those examples. And sometimes people forget that there are these frames on these, um, on these works where you do, in fact, have a lot of information up front. Another one like that is uh, Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion. Mariah is in a facility right at the very beginning of the book. In fact, um, you know, the, the woman who is taking care of her is just killing a pygmy rattlesnake in the artichoke garden. So you have this sense right at the beginning that things are not going to go well with Mariah. She's not, in fact, going to end up, you know, with her daughter and with Carter and with, you know, sort of the, the big questions of the book um, are, in fact, answered for us right at the beginning. So I love that, again, because it allows us to focus on the sort of why and how and not on the kind of like what happened. Um, so we have some information in those cases, but obviously not all the information. If we had all the information up front, it really would not be that interesting. But I want to move on to something that I think is even more interesting than this idea of this framework of having a narrator who is sort of telling us in the beginning what is you know, ultimately going to be the result of the, the course of the novel. So what I, what I think is even more interesting is um, what I'm calling these days the white lotus effect. So when you have a dead body at the beginning of a work, but you don't know who the body is, then you have this real tension because it does create this thing where you're like, not only 
like, are you like, oh my gosh, how did this person die? But you're like, who's gonna die? So it creates this tension that is so delicious because as you are moving through either the television series in the case of White Lotus, or if you're moving through a novel, you have this sense of like, oh, I wouldn't really care if that person dies, which is such a strange feeling. You're, or there are times actively where you're like, oh, I hope this is the person who dies. Or you're like, oh my God, please do not let it be this person who dies. So you have this sense um, that, that is just incredibly uh, effective in terms of getting you to, to sort of, you know, check how you're feeling about these different people, but also really investing in like, are they doing things that might lead to them being killed somehow? I recently read a book called The Feast, which was published in 1949 by a woman named Margaret Kennedy. She's British. It is so excellent. It's so excellent, in fact, that we are going to read it uh, in the bookstore next year as part of the uh, seminar series that we do at Kepler's. Um, it is so, so good. So you know right at the very beginning that there is this kind of old ramshackle uh, uh, inn on a coast in England, and there's been this huge mudslide, and the huge mudslide um, basically has just like taken out everyone who was in the hotel at that time. And then, you know, that's in the first sort of three or four pages, but, but there are some survivors, importantly. So throughout the whole entire novel, I mean, I have never read a book with that kind of, um, like that kind of interest in the plot. It was so genius. I mean, honestly, zip right out and read that right now. The thing that was so incredible about that book, though, is that the plot is so uh, expert and so good, but the plot would have felt gimmicky if the writing hadn't been so amazing. I mean, you care so much about every single one of these people. And, and there's just this enormous cast of characters. Um, one of the adages about writing is that it's very good to get a bunch of disparate people all together and, and sort of keep them in a small space. And there is nothing better than like a boarding house to bring together a disparate group of people. I mean, you have, it's definitely not Downton Abbey because the people who are running this boarding house are, um, they're, they're not servants. They are actually the people who own it, who have fallen on hard times. It's so interesting. So, but you have this whole kind of, all these different cross sections of, of society. You know, you have um, some spinsters and you have, I hate that word. You have some independent women who are there. You have a writer, you have all these different people, but, but this genius plot has it so that you are also watching their habits and you're like, okay, well, this woman always takes a walk in the afternoon. So I'm sure hoping that she gets saved because I'm hoping, you know, the big mudslide is going to occur when she's out or there are a lot of children. I mean, the whole time you're like, oh my God, like, I hope the children are not all just like taken out by uh, by this mudslide. So that is a very good example of, of this. It's like White Lotus Plus, because it's not just the one dead body um, and it's not just a whole bunch of rich people where you're sort of hoping most of them, frankly, will die. This is like, you love everybody in it and there's so much tension because it literally could have been everyone. But this idea of, of really monkeying with the plot, I mean, this is not a plot where you simply, I mean, in some ways it is because you have all of these different um, incidents that happen with all of these different people. And then it's moving toward the climax, which is of course, you know, this giant mudslide. Um, so it's, it's a very exciting and I think a very uh, interesting way to plot a novel. Okay, um, oh my gosh, and then, I mean, potentially even more interesting still are really radical departures from plot. So one that I wanna talk about relatively briefly because I also have a seminar about this woman um, is Eve Babbitt's Slow Days Fast Company. So this is a book that's like almost kind of difficult to call it a novel. The Library of Congress uh, classifies this as fiction. Um, some people call it biographical fiction, but it is a novel. Um, and the way, <clears throat> excuse me, the way that it, it sort of functions as a novel is you have these sketches, but up front, Eve Babbitt's in kind of a prefatory note um, tells us that this is, well, it's not Eve Babbitt's, it is kind of because it's so highly autobiographical, but the narrator is telling us that this is going to be a love story, it's not going to turn out well, and she sort of apologizes and says it was kind of an inadvertent love story. She goes on to say that the object of her affection is not a reader, 
And what she wants to do is kind of lure him in by having all of these italicized chunks that are directed toward him. And then as you're reading through, you realize that most of these sketches involve our narrator um, kind of getting with another guy. So they're not a single guy, it's like a different guy every time. This prose, it is so delightful and it has this incredible optimism and this incredible selection of details and just, it, it's like unbelievable prose. But it are, they are these sketches that could each stand on their own. They're not necessarily chronological. But because we have this idea that it's going to be this love story, and because we have the presence of this individual who she's trying to, um, you know, entice this person that she's trying to make jealous, then it does read like a novel. But in terms of plot, it is entirely unconventional. Um, I have now read this book many times, and most recently I got really into this like sleuthing thing. Like, who is the guy? Like, who is this lover that she is really wanting to make jealous and wanting to entice? And I really went down um, a, a rabbit hole that was very satisfying because I do think that there is sort of a, a good theory that you can back with some very good data about who this person is. So in terms of plot, it was sort of like a puzzle. And in fact, that was very satisfying for me, um, even though I think that is kind of the, the least important thing about uh, about the, the book, about Fast Days, wow, Slow Days, Fast Company. Okay, um, quick note on mystery writers. So you you know, this idea of solving a mystery, it, it's kind of a plot unto its own, um, but it is really beautifully uh, applicable to the Freytag Triangle. Usually you have some sort of exposition. I'm thinking of Agatha Christie here. Um, my favorite uh, mystery writer, I like Agatha Christie. I did not discover her until the pandemic. But I will say that I never read trying to figure out, like I am not paying attention to those sorts of details and trying to figure out who did it. I am in fact just reveling in her prose. Agatha Christie is so funny. Like they, there's so much humor and it's so, Miss Marple who comes in later is just like this incredibly charming but also incisive and independent and hilarious woman. So I was really charmed by the Agatha Christie. And you can see how, you know, the murder is an inciting event. And then you have kind of all these different things that are developing. And then the climax is usually some awesome sort of twist that is happening if it's Agatha Christie. Uh, and then you have the falling action uh, and the denouement. And usually the, that climax is very close to the end of the book and, and sort of you know, the, the following action and kind of the unwinding and the and the sort of moving away from the story is, is very kind of, it's kind of an afterthought. But but you really, I mean, obviously mystery stories, the plot is very important. Um, and, and it is actually interesting to think about it in terms of this Freytag uh, pyramid. Okay, the last book that I wanna talk about today is, um, is Virginia Woolf's so this, we're going to talk about Orlando. That is why I have placed myself in the mudroom, um, in and amongst these uh, images of our incredible Virginia Woolf. So, you know, I think she's best known, of course, for To the Lighthouse and Mrs. Dalloway and all of her nonfiction, The Common Reader, A Room of One's Own, Three Guineas, really, really important, important fiction. I came to Orlando a little late in the game. I picked it up at one point um, and, and didn't couldn't really get past the very first image. Um, it's I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I was like, oh, gosh, this is not I'm not really into this. But I went back to Orlando and it is un believable. It is a very good example of plot really taken to its extreme in the sense of plot as just really being kind of dismantled. I found it a very compelling book to read, not to say a page turner, not really a page turner. It's very long. It's very weird, but it is so, so good. And part of that is because of how it is plotted. So this is in Elizabethan England. So Elizabethan England, she was like, 1530 to like 1600s she was you know at the end of her reign was when we were having all of the um you know shakespeare with his elizabethan collar all of that so um he is a nobleman who is born orlando is in england he is a real favorite of the the court he is a page in the court he's a favorite of the queen he falls in love with this princess um who's kind of this renegade and that's when the story starts getting a little weird uh then somehow uh, around 30 years old because 
becomes a woman. She lives for 300 years. Um, she goes to Constantinople. Constantinople, by the way, being um, it's in Turkey. What, oh, Istanbul. I always forget. I remember the Turkey part, but not Istanbul. And, and Constantinople was like the heart of the Roman Empire. And all the way through the 1700s and 1800s is working on this poetry and having all of these different adventures. Um, and then we go all the way up until 1928, which is when the book was published. And um, this the, the, there's a lawsuit and she wins her lawsuit and then she gets a prize for this book called The Oak Tree, which is a book of poetry. And that book is published at the exact same time that Orlando is published on a certain date in 1928. So if you're just like, wait, what? It is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful, beautiful book. I mean, you have to really be ready for kind of a wild ride. But the reason I mention it is because the plot is unbelievable. I mean, the plot is really, um, you know, just, just freewheeling. This is Virginia Woolf at her freewheeling best. And, you know, people criticize books like To the Lighthouse or Mrs. Dalloway for not having any plot, when in fact there is a lot happening in those books. And I don't just mean in the prose. I mean, there's actually like a lot of plot, which some of you are like, wait, Mrs. Dalloway goes out and buys flowers and she has a party. like. It doesn't, I mean, in fact, you don't even really, you get to see some of the party, but like the party is not the point. Um, it, it is in that one afternoon, but a lot is happening in that book. It's really beautiful. Same into The Lighthouse. An enormous amount is happening in that book. Um, it's just very subtle. Uh, Orlando, not so subtle. I mean, it's subtle in some ways, but there is a lot, a lot, a lot happening. So um, I hope, I'm going to just leave it at that. I'm just going to just kind of cut things off quickly here, just because I think I have um, really given you a lot to think about in terms of plot. Um, you know, you've got your trusty old fried tag triangle. So when you're heading out into your next reading adventure, you can sort of think to yourself, what is happening with the plot here? What is um, what is my author? And if it's an author, you know, worth their salt, that author will, in fact, really um, either you know, adhere to a very satisfying kind of plot, which will be fun for you to diagram. Um, or, you know, the, the way that somebody can manipulate the plot, um, it's good to take a step back and think to yourself, what is this person doing with these manipulations? So, I mean, I said I was just going to stop, but now I can't quite stop. It's, it's enough to say, you know, okay, that it's plotted in this interesting way, but it is very important to stay, take one step further and say, what is the point? Like, why is Virginia Woolf doing this kind of wild thing? And it, it, I will argue that it has everything to do um, with Virginia herself as being very sort of um, fluid in terms of her gender and in terms of her sexuality. This was written at a time when she was in a very intense relationship with Vita Sackville West. So there's a lot of question about um, reinventing oneself and a lot of question about legacy and a lot of question about, um, you know, the endurance of writing and the endurance of tradition over time and the endurance of Shakespeare and, and the writing of men versus the writing of women. She was very interested in Margaret uh, Cavendish at this point, who was a writer in the um, in the the 18th century. Um, so, so there's a lot of questions about endurance and there's a lot of question about lifetimes. And so what she's doing with the plot has everything to do with the message in the book. So next time you um, run across a plot that's kind of unusual, um, that doesn't maybe fit the very neat fray tag, it's really cool to take a step back and ask yourself the question, you know, sort of what is this author doing with these um, manipulations of plot? Okay, so I hope that you have enjoyed um, this second installment of How to Read, and I hope that you're inspired um, to, you know, get out there and read some more, and then uh, come back, listen to another lecture at the Fox page, and, um, you know, get a sense of how plot is uh, performing, how it is structured, what's happening with it in other uh, pieces of literature. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you've learned a lot, and happy reading.